Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley and folks, happy 420. This, this worldwide cannabis celebration is now, believe it or not, in its 50th year. So to help celebrate it, oh, wait, wait a second. The AirPod fell out of her ear. I'm sorry. Uh, what we're going to have to do is uh, we'll start again my, the top. my ear. No, my earbud keeps falling out. Okay. Um, so somehow we've got to get on uh, so no that problem. I can hear it through the computer. Okay. So again, go to select a speaker and let me know if you could find what are your other options are. Uh, same as system, Jabra Link 380, AirBuds, built-in output, internal speakers, or Shure M47. Internal speakers. Okay. Tell me if you can hear us now. Tell me if you can hear us now. Yes, I can. Okay. Take that earbud off. And we will I'm start taking again. it off. Okay. Can we start over Not again? literally take it off, but, you know, just take the earbud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When you're ready, let's go and do that. Let's start. Okay. Sorry, guys. Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley and happy 420. This worldwide cannabis celebration is now in its 50th year. I don't know if I can believe that or not, but it's been 50 years. So to help celebrate and to give us the fascinating background on how, where, and why 420 started 50 years ago are two of the originators of 420. I, I'm so excited to finally meet you after all these years. And uh, they're in California. Why not? California, that's where it all started. And I'd like to welcome Steve Capper and David Reddix. Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley. How you doing, guys? We're doing good, Paxton. Thank you. Good, yeah, good. Thanks for having so, us. Um, I got to ask you, tell us how this whole 420 started. I mean, why do you guys, uh, how did you meet at 420 and why 420? Uh, and maybe Steve, you want to start it and then David, you can come in. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we were all going to high school together, uh, San Rafael High School, which is in the, basically the center of Marin. Uh, we, on our high school, we hung out on a wall. <laughs> we called ourselves the Waldos. We hung out on the wall. And uh, one day, a friend of mine came to me, not, not a Waldo, another friend. He said, hey, my brother is in the U.S. Coast Guard out at the Point Reyes Peninsula, and a bunch of guys in the Coast Guard are growing, the U.S. Coast Guard are growing marijuana. And for some reason, they think that their commanding officer is going to bust them, and they don't want to get busted. So they decided that, hey, they're going to abandon the patch, the plot, the growing project and decided that uh, Bill and his friends, us, could pick it. So they made a map of where, this, where the plot was, and we decided, hey, yeah, let's, let's go pick this. Steve brought it to us when we were sitting on the wall one day at a break, and, and it was a no-brainer. You know, you're 16 years old, you, you're, you're looking for free weed. It was a no-brainer, so we all decided we'd meet after school. There was a couple of guys that had... Uh, Sports practice, Waldo Jeff was the manager of, a foot, of the football team, and Larry was a, uh, on the JVC uh, football team. So we, we decided we'd meet at uh, 4.20 p.m. after, their, after uh, school activities and uh, sports, and we decided we'd meet at the Statue of Louis Pasteur on the campus of San Rafael High School. So school got out around 3 o'clock, 3.15. It was a flexible schedule. Sports practice was approximately an hour, and there was just enough time to do the sports practice and get back to the statue of chemist Louis Pasteur. That's why 420 worked out perfectly. Now, so we, met, we met there at 420 yeah. the first day. We got high and we jumped in Steve's 66 Impala with a killer Craig a a a Trek stereo, and we drove out to Point Reyes on our first day of the search. And, and that's how we. Is that how it began? <laughs> That's how it yeah. began. And then we didn't find it the first day. So in the ensuing days, weeks, we'd see each other in the hallways. And we decided, well, we'll just use this code. We'll, we, we see each other and go, 420 Louis. That was the original saying. And the other guys would go, yeah, 420 Louis. So that meant we were going to meet at 420 at the statue, get high and go and look for the patch. And, and where did, did you eventually find the patch? No, we never found it. Had a, never, fun, had a lot of fun times looking there. We, we never found there. the patch. Now, yeah. wait a second. Did, did the teachers know what you were doing? Were there other students? I mean, did they, anybody At else start time? congregating? 
no, 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 no. This was like our own secret code. And we were using 420 Louie for several weeks. And then uh, when we didn't find the patch, we decided, well, we didn't find the patch, but we have a little secret code joke we can use amongst ourselves. So we just dropped the Louie part and used 420 as a code we could use in front of cops, teachers, uh, parents, uh, friends, anybody. So it was our own little secret code joke. And it basically was a little joke amongst ourselves. And 420 here is, it's, I mean, everybody's going, everything's going legal now, but you have to understand this was all born out of drug suppression because the Coast Guardsman was fear, big fear of getting busted. B, it wasn't easy for us to get weed. It was highly secret to go purchase from somebody. You know, you're always looking over your shoulder. It was just so illegal then. And, uh, so, and then of course, uh, teachers and coaches and everybody. So it was all kind of born out of drug suppression, the whole 420 phenomena. And the fact that we were jokers, it was a private joke. And as you know, Paxton, back in the early 70s, you know, marijuana, getting busted for marijuana was a serious crime. You could get thrown in jail. Some people went to jail for 10 years for a joint. It was ridiculous. So we were always looking over our shoulders. We were like uh, underground dope smoking desperados. And there's <laughs> one other aspect, which is extremely ironic to our story, is that Waldo Jeff, one of the Waldos, his father was one of the highest level narcotics officers in the state of California. So we certainly, we needed a code around him. Did he ever pick up? I mean, didn't he smell it around you guys and say something? Well, Jeff used to, his, his dad would bring home uh, marijuana from bus in his trunk, right? So Jeff would get his key to the trunk and he'd go in there and he'd pinch some for us and we got high. So daddy so, was bringing it home. So there was actually a, a <laughs> drug enforcement officer that was supplying us with weed, but he didn't know. And he never caught on he at never, all? Well, one time he did catch on. He caught us in this little uh, shed out back where Jeff had a, an electric a water pipe and we were smoking that weed. Uh, and his dad pulled in early from work. And everybody was jumping out the windows and running away. And Jeff got caught and he was in big doo-doo. Oh. Go ahead. We had other codes and private jokes besides 420. We had other catchphrases. That and was just the tip of the iceberg. And he oh, was let's hear, can, we, can, you can you tell us the, the, these catch words? Others? Sure. Oh, by the way, on our website, 420 Waldos, I wrote out about 35 of them. Uh, there's like 100. Wrote out 35 explained how a lot of them that were formed, the origination stories of them, what they mean. It's all on our website. Um, what, uh, here's one. Uh, I had, this is amazing back in that time, but a, a teacher, an English teacher or journalism teacher said, I want you to write in a journal every single day. I don't care. She said, I don't care what you write. I don't care if you, it's one word, you draw a picture. I don't care if you take LSD. She actually said that or get high and write in it. So I, uh, I went down by where the, uh, the auto shop and the metal shops were. I got high, I got a notebook out and wrote down every single sound from all the machines coming out of the shops. And one of the sounds was zoit. I heard that coming out. And I went to the Waldos and I said, zoit. And of course they enjoyed that. And then one time uh, we were taking a hit off a joint and Waldo Mark, after he did the hit, he went And then we went zoit and that became one. Zoit. And then we'd go to over in the city in San Francisco, there were tourists and we'd walk up to them and go Zoit just to see their reactions. <laughs> and, and, and what would happen? I mean, did some people run away? Oh, people some would make, people, would some make people just gave us the weirdest looks and <laughs> thought these guys are kooks, which we were, but uh, we were having a lot of fun being kooks. But a lot, now, a lot of those, those catchphrases had much deeper you know, meaning, sociological significance, and they're on, they're on the website. And, and we even have sound bites of them. Yeah, we, we, we have uh, that too. <laughs> yeah, sound bites of us, you know, enacting the, the uh, phrases and the catchphrases. Now, I understand also that there's something having to do with Grateful Dead and that they actually helped you in a way. Uh, give us the background about Grateful Dead and how you got involved with them. Well, Steve, you can tell them about Mark, and then I'll tell them about my, my connection. Waldo Mark, his dad was a real estate broker that handled uh, real estate needs for the Grateful Dead organization. So, like, 
they big organization. They always needed office space. They needed place when they needed a place to rehearse. He would rent them a warehouse to rehearse. They needed places to store their equipment. Everybody in the dead made a lot of money. They were buying homes in the Marin County Hills. And when uh, when he'd sell them their homes, he'd say, "Hey, uh, uh, Waldo, Mark, you know, we, we, uh, the Waldos, they can take care of your your pets when you go on tour or whatever." And somebody calls you Waldos. <laughs> his his dad was cool. We'd go to. Winterland, we go to shows, he'd always get on the guest list. So we were always backstage with the dead community, you know, running, running around. And of course they picked up 420 from us. And uh -huh. uh, it really got started when uh, my brother Patrick was uh, friends with Phil Lesh for 50 years. Patrick died about two and a half years ago of cancer. And unfortunately he, he, he died exactly at 420 PM. And I was there and I witnessed it. Of natural causes, he's part of our story. Oh, he died of cancer. But oh. anyway, I was there and uh, Pat was good friends with Phil for 50 years. And and back in 1975, uh, the, the Grateful Dead were taking a hiatus from touring for about nine months. And Phil wanted to uh, keep his musical chops going. So he started a couple bands. The first one was called uh, Too Loose to Truck, a take on Too Loose Le Trek. <laughs> and Sea Stones, and he asked Pat to manage those bands for him, and Pat hired me as a roadie. So I was touring around California with his band and getting high with uh, Phil and guys like Terry Haggerty and David Crosby. One time we were getting high with Crosby backstage at the uh, Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, and Pat's over there coughing on a bong and, and, and encouraging Crosby to do all kinds of crazy things. And, and Crosby comes up to me and goes, man, your brother is crazy. And I'm going, this is David Crosby telling me my brother's crazy from a crazy guy. So anyway, uh, it kind of spread uh, amongst the guys in the band and the, uh, the roadies and the people that, you know, would show up for shows backstage and, it kind of spread from there, as well as from our, you know, our, our siblings and friends. For those, uh, for, for your listeners who don't know, Phil Lesh is the basis for the Grateful Dead. Not everybody knows that. The basis, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's good that you, you said that. Now, did you ever get caught? I mean, did the police ever, uh, uh, when you, oh, were, yeah. you were working with the dead? I mean, what happened? Were, were you, oh, we, did you ever end up in jail? <laughs> no, we, I didn't end up in jail working for Phil and his bands, but uh, there was a, several close calls the Waldos had uh, with getting busted, like on the way to see The Tonight Show. Uh, one time we were driving down to see The Tonight Show in 74 and we're driving with a, uh, a, a friend from school. She was along with us and we're getting high. We're down by uh, San Luis Obispo County and all of a sudden Steve says, put the joints out. There's a cop behind us. There's a motorcycle cop behind us, right? And so uh, we're all, freaking out and throwing the joints out the window, but the windows were rolled up and they were bouncing back in. And one guy kept on smoking. Steve's all, stop smoking, you know? And all of a sudden there's like four a motorcycle behind us, two cop cars on the sides of us and one in front. And they pull us over to the side of the road and we're freaking out. So the cops all stop. They wait a few minutes and we're just, we're biting nails inside the car. And uh, so, after a few minutes, all these cops got out of the cars and the motorcycles, and they all had their guns drawn, and they came up to the window, pointing at us, our heads. Steve rolled the window down, a big cloud of smoke went out, and the, and the cops said, give me your driver's licenses. Uh, and so we complied, and we were freaked out, and we didn't realize that he wasn't even thinking about the pot smoke. He went back to the car. They ran a check on us for about 20 minutes. They come back. And they hand us our driver's license back and they said, you can go. We're all, well, why did you stop us? And the cop says, we thought you were the SLA and that was Patty Hearst with you. Wow. I remember the so, man, the big yes. for Patty Hearst. We got caught up in that, the Waldos. The Waldos. So, <laughs> so they didn't even smell the, the marijuana. They smelled it, but they, they, didn't they were just thinking about catching the SLA. And for some reason, they must have been hot to trot and go catch other people. But they let us go. And it was amazing. But uh, before they let us go, we were late for the show. And Steve told him something. Well, we were trying. Carson taped at 530. And we we're trying to get down there for that show. And all of a sudden, now we're delayed like an hour. And I was miffed. I mean, I, I was such a Johnny Carson fan. I looked at the cop and he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. And I was stoned out of my mind. I said, 
you goof, now we're going to miss Johnny Carson. <laughs> what just, did he say to that? Just he didn't say like anything. He just said, let us go. Yeah, like he looked at me kind of confused, like, what is he talking about? <laughs> so after, you, you know, you, you started on the road again, you didn't have any more uh, grass to smoke, though, right? Oh, we did. They, out? they asked us, they, they said, uh, they actually, they, they didn't even talk about the grass. I'm sorry. They didn't even bring it up. They just let us go, even though the car was just filled with smoke. So we <laughs> went down to L.A. and we had another run in with uh, security at Disneyland. We go to Disneyland. Well, we we back up a second, Dave. We got down there that night and we couldn't find a hotel. We went from hotel to hotel and there no vacancies everywhere. We had so much weed on us. Gas was like 29 cents, 30 cents a gallon. We said, well, we can't get a hotel. Let's just cruise the freeways of LA until the sun comes up smoking weed. And that's what we did. We had a lot of We weed. got high all night with Steve driving around and uh, the sun came up and... Uh, then we decided to go to Disneyland. We get to Disneyland, we get high in the parking lot. This is back before a lot of the security uh, procedures they have now, you know, yes. with cameras everywhere. So we get high in the parking lot. We go into Disneyland. We're riding that uh, tram, which is the, that goes through the Matterhorn, you know? Oh, yes. We're, we're smoking a joint in that and we get off the tram and immediately like four big bruiser security guards meet us as we get off the ride and they said, come with us. And they take us in a back room and uh, there's some guy there with two other guys and they interrogate us and they're all, we don't like people smoking marijuana in Disneyland and you guys, we know you're smoking. And so they gave us a long lecture. And at the end they said, do you have any more weed on you? We said, oh no, we don't have any more weed. We won't do this ever again. They said, okay, we're going to let you go this one time. So they let us go. And then, Steve, I'll let you pick up the story from there. Okay, so we go right over to Frontierland. You know, we're in line for this ride where, or this area where there's a huge uh, desert, the Pacific Southwest. It looks like Utah and all the national parks, a couple acres. And uh, so we're in line. We hop over a chain link fence, fence, run up a hill and run down a hill. All of a sudden, we're in the middle of the Southwest. And we go, well, we got to smoke out here. You know, a couple acres. <laughs> So we're running all over the little mock-up Southwest at Disneyland, smoking weed. And then all of a sudden, there's a train that comes up and through a tunnel into the Southwest. And we go, hey, and we hear the whistle. We go, the train's coming. And, and we we're run all up, freaking uh, out. <laughs> yeah, we run up behind this big, giant boulder. And all, all, we're all crouched behind the boulder. We Smoking ride a, a, a little joint. And we're crouched behind there. The train comes up into the middle. And all of a sudden, the train stops. And the tour guide of the train stands up. He looks at us, points like right at us and says, oh my God. He goes, oh my God. And we, th we thought for sure we responded. He goes, it's Old Faithful. And right next to my foot, a geyser sprouts up like 20 <laughs> feet in the air. And it's just soaking the hell. And we can't run away from the rocks because the yeah. you know, everybody will see we us. get busted. The security will bust us. So we got totally soaked. And then, of course, eventually uh, they, the, the train went on and we had to, you know, we got out of there. But that, there's a, And it, it put the joint out, too. That was the worst part. Oh, that was the worst part. Sure, of course. <laughs> we got other stories. I could tell you another one, but I don't know how much time you have and how much. Oh, you we, have. Still, we still have got some time. Tell us another good one, because okay. I'm sure our listeners are, are just going to love this. Give us one more good one. OK, so. Well, I was, I was, of the Waldos, I was probably the goody-goody, and I didn't want to get busted. So we're going up to go to Tahoe, uh, like summertime, like Tahoe. That was, that was Steve and me and Waldo Jeff. Yeah, and uh, I didn't want to get busted. And Jeff had a, a really good knowledge of uh, search and seizure laws. I mean, his dad was a narc. They talk about it around the dinner table. So all the way up to Lake Tahoe, Jeff is teaching me about search and seizure laws. I mean, Dad, I, I'm memorizing them. Like California law, 264893. You can keep a marijuana in a, a locked glove box, and they can't make you open a locked glove box. So we get up to Tahoe. We pull into a parking lot. Dave and uh, Jeff go off to the bathroom down the street. And right, I at the our, casino. I, it was right on state line, so we were in Nevada at the time. Yeah, but we didn't, we didn't know that. I, I'm in the car rolling a joint on the glove box. I turn around, there's a cop there. I immediately put the stuff in the glove box. I turn, I lock it up. I look back, you know, there's like three cop cars back there. 
guy comes up, he goes, he goes, what's in, let me see your license and registration. He goes, let me see what's in that glove box. I go, no. He goes, he goes, you got to open. I go, no, I don't. He goes, yes, you do. And I go, no, according to California law 3.2694, I don't have to open a locked glove box. He goes, you're a Nevada boy. I was like, <laughs> I was like, you know, a hundred yards over the border. And, and, and it, Steve and I are seeing this from a distance and we're, we're watching from the casino and oh shit, he's bust. <laughs> so so what happened next? What happened next? So he, go, he goes, uh, so I realized I had to turn it over. He hands it over to another cop and he's looking through it. He goes, oh, this isn't too good. Too many seeds and stems. He goes, do you want a receipt for this? Because when they bust you, they actually have to give you a receipt. And of course, being the joker I was, they gave out trading stamps and supermarkets. I go, do you give out blue chip stamps too? And they kind of chuckled. And uh, so they were talking and they go, you know, if there's any more weed in this car, you got to give it to us. And I'm thinking, hey, well, he, goes, he, goes, he goes, we're going to make you a deal. You can give us all the weed you have in this car right now, and we may or may not bust you, or, uh, or we can search your car, and we're definitely going to bust you. Like, what is your choice? So I gave him, uh, opened up the trunk, gave him a couple lids, and he goes, uh, talk to his friend. He goes, we're going to let you go. And we're going to put your name on this list. And he took out like a school, school notebook. And I saw about 40 names. You're going to be 362 in the state of Nevada. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to get out of the state of Nevada and you can never come back for the rest of your entire life. I'm like, what, what? <laughs> can I do that? And uh, so he goes, I, I, I go, are you sure? I, I got to find my friends. He goes, you have 60 seconds starting right now. So I got in my car. I went back over to the California, right where the border was, California, Nevada. And we met and, up with him. Yeah. And uh, I could see the cops down the street. And I know they didn't have jurisdiction in California. So when they saw me, I would jump on the Nevada side of the border. We were see, all jumping back and forth. Back as soon as they would start coming my way, I jumped back to, to the California side. <laughs> just, to, just to anger the cops, you know. But, but anyway, so we didn't know if they could stop us from going into Nevada, if this was bullshit or not. So we pulled money and we called all these attorneys to see if, we, if it was possible. Nobody would talk to us. I mean, I think we had a total of $75. Nobody at South Shore would talk to us. So we drove all the way around to the North Shore opened up the phone book and there was an attorney named Joseph Joint. And we go, that's our guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we called him up and he said, yeah, I'll see you got $75, come on in. So we went there and we told him our story. So can we go back into Nevada and go to the beach? I said, yeah, probably. And of course that's what we did right away. <laughs> what a great story. I, I mean, you probably have uh, maybe a hundred different stories because- I don't you know if we have that many. Yeah. <laughs> We've got <laughs> a lot of stories though. Yeah, then, well, that's good. Now, let's get serious for a moment. Um, um, how are you feeling about that, that, you know, 420 is an international holiday? I mean, basically, you started it. You know, you're, you're uh, uh, George Washington or something like that. <laughs> we, you know what, Paxton? At the time, we didn't know we were uh, creating history. We were just having fun and enjoying ourselves. And it's pretty mind-boggling that a little private joke could go become a worldwide phenomenon, but we're, we're very happy about it. And the most important thing about us was, you know, friendship and humor and kindness and having fun. And that's the spirit that we have always had for 420. And we wish that upon everybody on 420 to be kind to your neighbors, your friends, have fun, stay safe, enjoy yourself and pick up the mess you leave afterwards. Ah, that's but important. We always yes. thought of it as a joke. We still, we don't take it too seriously. We still have the, the e even people who take it more seriously and use it as a, a forum to discuss legalization, everything like that. It still kind of still has a, the fun, it exudes a fun vibe. People have fun with it. So tell me, what are you all doing now? Uh, are you in all different kinds of business? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now. Uh, well, although Jeff works in the wine industry, he has worked in the, uh, up in uh, Sonoma County for the last 35 years. Uh, Waldo Larry is a, 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 a graphic designer and a print, printing salesperson. And Waldo Mark is a, uh, a semi-retired, he's a uh, 
your school yearbook photographer. Myself, I, I worked for CNN for almost 20 years as a cameraman field producer, and now I'm an independent filmmaker. Great. So yeah. you're, you, 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 you've, jo you've joined the, uh, the business community in all sorts of different ways. It, it's, it's really interesting to know about that. Now, I know that you sell a lot of your products uh, online. Tell us about, uh, well, the website and all that. And I'm really interested in your 420 watch and what's that all about? Um, okay, so first of all, the website, so there was so much confusion about 420. So many people were making up so many tales. It got out of hand for years. And we wanted to uh, you know, lay down accurately what it was. We have actual lots of physical evidence proof going back to the early 1970s that we were using 420 before anybody else. So a lot of stuff we wanted to get it down in a concise uh, place. Um, Selling anything, that was never our goal. We, we, we didn't have any interest in selling t-shirts or anything. Of course, we, we had to get some trademarks because we didn't want anybody, everybody stealing our, our name and stuff like that. So we did that more for, you know, to get trademarks. Uh, the watch, Dave, you want to explain that watch? Uh, a few years ago, a, a, a guy approached us and said he wanted to make a Waldo's watch. So he produced it and uh, I think they've been out since last year. Uh, it's timeconcepts.com. Uh, you can find them there. And uh, we also have a, uh, a Waldo Special Ale beer with Lagunitas Brewing Company in Petaluma and Chicago, which is now owned by Heineken. You can find our beer in uh, Safeway and Trader Joe's and a lot of stores. The beer's been out for 10 years. It's done. Yeah, this is our 10th year anniversary of the Waldo Special Ale. And it's seasonal. They do it about two months before 420 for the ramp up. How smart. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Uh, well, give, you, give the name of your website so people can go there and, and actually look at all the products. www.420waldos.com. Good, good. There is a lot of stuff there. It's a huge site. A lot of it's very fun. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, interviews, podcasts. There's... Uh, uh, a lot of stuff there, a lot of interesting, fun stuff there. And are you putting more stuff up? All the time. I was all working the time. on a new page this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So yeah, I'll, I'll add another go page. Ahead and go there immediately and see what's going yeah. on. Well, listen, you know, it's been so much fun talking to you, learning more about uh, uh, the history uh, of you guys. It's really terrific and, and 420 and all that. And uh, maybe next year at 420, you'll, you'll come back and you'll, you'll have even more good stories to tell us. And it's amazing that after all these years, you still remember a lot of what, what happened to you while you were stoned. I mean, a lot of people, when they get stoned, apparently, they don't remember a thing, you know, a, a couple of days later. So um, I, I got to say, that's good that you can tell these wonderful well, the, stories. The website is truly motivation to, to get it down and get it recorded. So I think real hard, what, you know, what can we document on the website? And you can see our whole hilarious backstory there. So we'd recommend everybody go check it out. Give it again. Give your give it. Give it again. What is it? www420 dot four twenty waldos dot com. Four two zero. Okay. Yeah, four two zero w a l d o s. Well, you have fun today, and okay. uh, all of us here are, are really happy to have you on, and we look forward to having you on next year for four twenty. Thanks, so, Paxton, and everybody enjoy four twenty and happy four twenty. Happy four twenty. <laughs> Yes, happy 420. Folks, this 420 interview with the Waldos and all of our shows can be heard on Apple, Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, uh, iHeart, or wherever you listen to your, your broadcasts. And we uh, thank you very much to be here. Of course, I'd like to thank our listeners who have purchased my latest suspense novel, which is called Just Try Me. And that's available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. And last but not least, happy 420. Happy 420. I'm Paxton Quigley. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.